Hey guys, what's going on? This is John from Friends of the Your Benefits. You may remember that about a year ago, we had Jen Roberts on from Hello Heart. And in that video, we had spent a lot of time talking about the Hello Heart app that goes along with the blood pressure monitor and some of the digital coaching and some of the neat features that are involved there. Well, Hello Heart has expanded its offering and we all know that GLP-1s are really driving employer costs as of lately. And today, Jen is back to actually talk to us about how Hello Heart can help companies manage their GLP-1s. Hey, Jen, how's it going? Welcome back. Great. Thanks for having me back, John. This is an interesting topic we've got today. Absolutely. And virtually every meeting I'm going to with clients, I mean, this is literally top of mind. So before we get started, right? So one thing that just struck me is you always have an interesting background. So can you tell our audience a little bit about today's background? Is it real, number one? It's it's real in that it's wallpaper. And $99 at Amazon, you can have it too. So go for it. There you go. Amazon literally sells everything. You may have seen my you know previous video on Amazon Pharmacy. So you know, there you go. You can literally buy anything on Amazon. So Jen, I guess you know, if we're going to get started right here. So I heard a brand new term uh, at a recent carrier utilization meeting. I'm curious if you heard the term, and hopefully I say it correctly cardio diabetes. So have you heard that term before? And if you have, like, you know, how would you describe it to the audience? I have. And I think it's a recycling of old terms and things, John, you and I have been working on for a long time. And it's really about how diabetes, weight, and cardiovascular health all kind of overlap um, in, in overlapping circles. And, and where do you, as the employer, as the individual, as the consultant, help try to manage that spend, that risk burden when you've got all these overlapping competing things going on. And um, I would say the soup du jour a few years ago was metabolic syndrome. It even became a diagnosis code. Um, and there were metabolic syndrome risk factors, which were not a surprise. They were blood pressure, they were cholesterol, they were weight. So it's the same term that keeps getting recycled. And yet, from a public health standpoint, we still have a little bit of inertia on how to tackle it. Okay, fair enough. And I guess what's old is new, and it's an, it sounds like it's it's basically a new marketing term, but definitely good to know. So, uh, yeah, basically, if I take a look at all the utilization reports from my clients, right? So I'd say there's kind of two buckets of clients. There's the clients, which is virtually everyone that covers GLP ones for diabetes today, and then many clients, but not all, are covering GLP ones for weight loss purposes, and those that are are likely seeing a big increase in cost. So just you know, really curious uh, from your perspective, Jen, you know, for clients who are considering, you know, covering weight loss medications, aside from just covering it and hoping for the best, is there anything else that they can really do to control cost? Well, I think weight loss medication coverage has always been controversial. And it's interesting because from a medical necessity standpoint, it doesn't raise to that standard. And that's a specific term, medical necessity. And that allows the employer to exclude certain drugs from their formulary. Um, this can be, you know, great for costs and great for kind of misuse of these types of medications. But at the same time, if you think of that sort of triad of blood pressure, cholesterol and diabetes um, together and underlying all of that is weight. Um, it's sort of about where do you take a bite of the elephant, right? Um, if you have to start with one. And so I think employers are, are starting to to think of different strategies to make this work. What's interesting about semaglutide, which is the primary active ingredient in most of these weight loss injectable drugs is that it started as a diabetes medication many years ago. It's probably on your formulary. If you didn't already know that it has really good outcomes for diabetes. And what they noticed is that, hey, these people taking it for diabetes are losing kind of a lot of weight. So the manufacturers went back and created another study that was just focused on weight loss. So it meant you could take the drug in the study, but you didn't have to have diabetes as a comorbidity. So um, sure enough, they saw really strong weight loss outcomes with this drug. And then one brand in particular, Wagovi, which you guys have probably heard of, you're looking at around $1,000 a month for that. And it is considered a lifetime medication um, for a chronic condition. Um, so it's it's not something you kind of go on and go off. At least that's the, the medical recommendation for it. And with Wagovi, they saw the weight loss, but then they also saw improvement in cardiovascular disease. This is not a surprise for people in a clinical area, because if you lower weight, 
and you lower your diabetic status, either your hemoglobin A1C, different things like that, your risk for cardiovascular disease goes down. Um, so they created this new study. It's called the SELECT trial. It came out at the end of last year and it had some really amazing outcomes and I'm not supporting it. I'm just sharing that their primary endpoint was a reduction in death from cardiovascular disease. And in fact, it had a 20% reduction. So if you think about it now, you know, it's one thing to take this medication um, because you want to improve your diabetes status and you don't want it to get further into, you know, end stage renal failure or something like that. It's a totally different thing to say, hey, would you like to lose some weight? You'll probably be healthier. But now when patients are going to be approached about taking this drug from their care providers, they're going to say, hey, this could lower your risk of a heart attack in the next five years by 20%. It's really going to drive adherence. And you're also going to be very challenged as an employer or a health plan to take it off your formulary because it absolutely will hit the threshold of medical necessity. So I'm just saying it's going to be a big issue for all of your consultants and actuaries. Get your pencils out and your calculators right now in terms of predicting spend. Yeah. And, and the challenging thing is, you know, I think roughly 40% of the U.S. population could potentially be eligible for these medications. You know, J.P. Morgan also did a study and they said by 2030, they expect that the market cap for weight loss drugs will exceed $100 billion, believe it or not. So it's, it's definitely a huge amount of money. And then, you know, Jen, to your point, I did see that, you know, while Medicare today does not cover weight loss drugs for that very specific diagnosis, where let's say you're suffering from obesity, but you have heart related issues for the first time ever, Medicare will cover it. So, you know, some additional employers may follow suit and, you know, maybe some will say, hey, if you happen to have this, um, you know, comorbidity, it's going to be eligible. Others may not. But, you know, curious where, where you see this landscape going in the future. I think that's absolutely right. Once Medicaid and Medicare approve something, it is almost impossible to exclude it, right? Because they have basically the highest threshold, the most limitations, um, because they're supporting, you know, the largest pooled group in all of America, essentially between those two. And because of this medical necessity and this ability to prevent death from heart attack and, and even stroke, that's why they're using these drugs. And I think what's really interesting about all of them, no matter what the brand name is and, and the variation in efficacy on it, they all are labeled in conjunction with lifestyle change. So these people who are taking them and having outcomes, they already have what's called a selection effect. They're motivated to make some kind of change or they wouldn't have been participating in the study or they wouldn't have been doing the, here's health education or healthy lifestyle change while you're taking this drug. You don't know if it's real or if it's a placebo. So in, in that sense, it really behooves employers to put together a really strong lifestyle change program. And it's funny because, you know, when we were baby consultants, John, uh, wellness programs were great. And then they were like a totally four letter word. Right. And now that's everything old and new is new again, just like you were saying, because here we are, it's like move more, eat better, reduce stress and risky behaviors like smoking and alcohol. It's, it's not really rock and science in that way. And so one thing you guys can do if you are approving it, and if you're not approving these drugs, you are going to have to be very soon with the new relabeling by the FDA of Wagovi for cardiovascular disease um, is put in a really strong lifestyle management programming. One, you don't want to invest this money and they cycle on and off and have poor outcomes and then keep getting prescribed the drugs. And number two, if you are paying for it right now or you're happy to be paying for it, you want them to have the best chance to make a difference. And then three, I would say at this level of investment, $1,000 a member a month, it behooves you to make sure that they have the strong lifestyle piece behind it to, to magnify those results. And at the same time, one nice thing that we also do, and, and we made these changes at the beginning of last year, John actually is um, in our medication formulary at Hello Heart. So in our, in our app, we're doing digital lifestyle coaching, but at the same time, we're doing medication adherence coaching. So we went ahead last year and put in um, the various GLP ones that they could put in there um, as terms of medication so they could get reminders. And then they could infuse their digital coaching with messages that make sense to this group who's using that kind of medication. So I'm going to challenge you to something, Jen, right? So yeah, I've heard from a lot of employers that Hello Heart is a great blood pressure tool out there and the app is great, right? But, you know, Hello Heart is in the cardiovascular space. 
how do you think you guys can successfully make the leap into, um, you know, potentially the diabetes and obesity space? You know, it's funny because everything's cardiovascular. If you have the flu and you need to go into the doctor or you get admitted to the hospital, if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, you're more likely to have poor outcomes. If you had knee surgery because you're a weekend warrior, same thing if you've got those chronic conditions. Um, when we look at how heart health affects all different parts of your body, um, it can include, you know, kidney disease, it can include uh, brain function, sexual function as well. And the, the brain function is really important because there's another study that's coming out from the same company with the exact same medication with semaglutide as the, the active ingredient. And what they're doing is they they're doing a specific trial that's looking at how this drug improves cognitive mental decline. So these are kind of the early stages of dementia and Alzheimer's, and they already started to show promising results that when you take this drug, you reduce the, the cognitive decline or reduce the rate of cognitive decline or incidence of mild cognitive impairment. And if you think about it, that seems like weird and not related, but if you're improving your cardiovascular system, it goes all the way up to your brain. If you're improving that system, you're improving blood flow and you're improving oxygenation in your body and your heart's not having to work so hard um, to do its basic functions, your blood pressure's under control, your arteries look super clear and they're not clogged with plaque. It kind of makes sense that other parts of your bodies will work. So the next big study that's coming out for this exact same drug is related to cognitive decline. So we'll probably see a relabeling of this drug um, in the future as well. Hmm. So one thing that you mentioned, right, obviously lifestyle is very, very important. And it's great that, you know, Hello Heart can help out with that. So unfortunately, as of right now, with many of the GLP ones, there's some nasty side effects. And I think the latest I heard is that after six months, about 50% of the people stop taking the medication. And, you know, once they stop taking it, you know, as you said, they're on it for the rest of their life, the weight comes back. How do you, do you see any employers saying potentially, okay, if you want the GLP one medication for these conditions, you have to be enrolled in a hello heart like program and be actively engaged to continue to have access to medication. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I would say we definitely have clients doing that right now. I think it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't have to be hello heart, but it should be something strong. What the drug manufacturers are offering is basically like a chat box on text. Here's a reminder. How are you feeling today type of a thing? I wouldn't call it coaching under any stretch of the imagination. Um, what I do think, though, is that uh, because it's been relabeled for cardiovascular disease, and to your point, at least 40% of Americans will be eligible. Well, that's 40% of Americans um, who have weight issues and one or more cardiovascular disease. The number's probably a little bit higher. As we get older, it gets higher. Um, as our sloth of a generation continues to grow, it gets higher. So I don't know that we've ever seen a drug that's advertised, you know, um, on TV during Monday night football or something like that, that appeals to so many masses, you know, normally they're all very expensive, right? But normally it's for this like tiny little population subset of a subset. And this is something that now the market's going to demand it. We've already kind of seen it in media uh, demanding it and kind of social selling, I guess, so to speak from different celebrities and pseudo celebrities. I would say though, to the side effects. So at about a year, you're looking at 75% of people drop off the medication because of the side effects. And the majority of those people gain all that weight back. So that's why you're hearing kind of from the medical community that this is really more of a lifestyle medication. However, who wants to take a shot every day for the every week or two or three times a month for the rest of their life? That's why right. we have such poor adherence in diabetes because people don't want to stick their finger with the needle multiple times a day, check their blood sugar and make an adjustment. The shot is probably less work than that, but we know people don't like needles. So I feel like it's something that works in like dire straits, medical necessity, meaning that you had an absolutely critical have to make a change right now. But I think most people are just not going to do it. And, and partly the way the drug works is sort of slowing your digestive function. And what we don't know, we absolutely don't know, is what does things look like in 10 years or 15 years for people who are longtime users? Is there any permanent damage to slowing the digestive tract? Um, is there no damage at all? But it's just kind of that unknown. And not everyone wants to be a guinea pig on that. 
Absolutely. And I, I saw a recent article and they're talking about Ozempic babies, right? Where I guess one potential positive side effect, you know, could be that if you're struggling to, you know, get pregnant, potentially Ozempic can help, right? So that, that was something I, I was very surprised when I saw that. Curious your reaction. I read that today and I was shocked. Um, I think from a clinical standpoint, um, losing weight can help um, polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, which is something that is a huge issue with um, infertility or a large cause of infertility. So it could be something there with the weight. Again, we kind of think of all these, these layers on top of each other. We're talking about diabetes, obesity, or we're talking about hypertension. And now we're kind of bringing in infertility and we're bringing in cognitive function. And at the end, what sits on top of that is heart health. And what are all the things that you can do to improve heart health? So I'm just going to say it again, move more, eat better, reduce stress and risky behaviors like alcohol and smoking. Those are the things that we need to do. And if we become increasingly reliant on pharmaceutical interventions, I mean, kind of where, where does it stop from there? Um, I don't know. It's an interesting perspective what the world's going to look like in say 15, 20 years at this point. Absolutely. And yeah, I still use the Hello Heart app today. And at least, you know, for my medications, I do like the daily reminder, hey, John, you got to take the medications and, you know, all the little tips that come up. I, I found that really, really neat. So Jen, where do you see Hello Heart, you know, going in the future? Any new innovations coming that you can share? I think our biggest uh, kind of secret thing that we're working on that I'll share with the team is really predictive risk analytics. So if we're getting in all of these data feeds from, from your biometrics, from your Hello Heart monitor, you know, are you having arrhythmias, irregular pulse, spikes in blood pressure, hypertensive crises, different things like that. If your cholesterol readings are coming in and, and things are looking out of whack, if you're of a certain age and, and biological female, your hormones are changing with menopause. So really taking in all those feeds real time as well as the individual's notes and comments on what's working for them, what's not, what kind of symptoms are existing when they're experiencing these irregularities is leading us to prediction of risk. So what would it be like if you knew 10 days in advance that you were at risk for having a heart attack or stroke? Not five years, like that study, not 10 years, not one year, but 10 days. And would that challenge you to seek out your provider and get help before it's too late? So as we keep growing with membership and data feeds coming in, we get closer and closer to working on this risk prediction analytics software that I think will be revolutionary in our industry. And from the standpoint of the individual person, you and me, we own our health. We, we're collecting yeah. this information. We share it to the providers we want to when we want to. We're not in the back seat. We're in the front seat. We're driving the car of our personal health. And I think once people can, and some do, but once people can really truly be their own best advocate for their health care, that's when wonderful things happen between them and their provider, right? Um, I think a lot of times you want to, you know, the doctor knows best, and they maybe they do. Um, or the system won't let me in for eight weeks, or I've got to do X, Y, and Z, and maybe I don't have the money for all those co-pays. Once we can kind of get away from that and realize that you are paying for your health insurance, you are paying for that doctor, it is a medical practice, and you are part of that practice, um, and your input is important, that overall improves health outcomes. And we see that with women's health right now. I mean, women are two times more likely to die of a heart attack in men. Why? No reason. Specifically, they get dismissed as their symptoms are anxiety. You and I are going to have different symptoms for a heart attack and you're probably going to go in, they're going to run an EKG. They're going to run some labs to see if you have any spikes and certain things that indicate something's going on. They're more likely to tell me it's probably anxiety and I should go home. I did not know that. Incredible. Wow. No, and that's, that's a huge point. That's one of the themes, obviously, of our channel is it's really, really important just to be your own best friend and advocate as it relates to your overall health and well-being. So, Jen, from our previous video on, on the YouTube channel, I did receive a few questions from people out there. And just curious your perspective. How accurate is the Hello Heart blood pressure digital monitor since people are doing it at home? It's FDA approved, clinically validated. And the only thing I would say is I love an Apple Watch. I've got one myself. My yep. daughter's got one. My husband's got one. The very, thank you. The very best kind still to this day is to do an upper arm cuff um, and test from mm. there. This technology is good, but it's not great. Um, so I would say if your Apple Watch gives you a funny reading, 
then you should go and take your blood pressure with your Hell and Heart Monitor and verify. And then you have the ability to send all of that information to your doctor. I don't know if you've done that before, John. Hopefully you haven't had the need to, but you can split up your reports the past week, 30 days, 60 days, all the medications you're on, any other irregularities, any symptoms that you um, noticed that you checked off when you were having abnormal readings, that's going to go straight to the provider so that they can take action as well. And um, having worked in a clinic and hospital setting for many years, when you get a report that's got a big, thick pink line on top that says urgent action needed and these symptoms, et cetera, uh, you pretty much do something with that and you get that person in for an appointment. Oh, great. Now, Jen, really appreciate you coming on today. If there's someone out there, right, and they want to learn a little bit more about Hello Heart or perhaps connect with you directly, where can they go? The best place to go is www.helloheart.com. You can learn all about it. We've got pages for individuals, for employers, and for consultants like you, John. Um, so you can get the information you need to get it back to your clients. Awesome. Well, Jen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really learned a lot, and I really appreciate our discussion on Hello Heart and the GLP-1s. Thanks so much. Have a great day.